Seems like we got most of the people that are interested in it. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for coming to uh, talk about VR motion sickness, or in general coming to a talk about VR. It's, it's just great to see that um, even though it's sort of still early in, in its current iteration of VR, there's so many people interested in it. And I'm very happy to see that so many people are interested in, it, in uh, making VR that doesn't make you motion sick. Um, thank you, thank you everybody for coming to the talk. Please stop making people sick. Lessons learned during five years of VR development. And since it's still some, somewhere Halloween somewhere, um, there's a little pumpkin that's vomiting. Um, and hopefully by the time uh, I'm done with this talk, we don't cause um, next year's pumpkin to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit about me. Uh, I have been doing uh, natural user interface and VR, VR development for the past five years. Um, I'm organizing a couple of meetups, um, I'm doing some other things, but I'm mainly a game dev. So I have released uh, four to five games, depending on how you count, on several platforms. I did Google Cardboard Games, Gear VR, Rift, PlayStation VR, and HTC Vive. Um, so I've been working with, with all the systems, and I've tried many, many VR games. Uh, probably my most recent game is uh, GravLab, that's uh, um, on early access right now for Vive. And it's a, it's a physics puzzle game, and it's also a touch launch title. Um, I'm also working on a couple of non-gaming um, VR applications. Uh, most notable right now is the Australian Sports VR that I'm doing for the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and Trade here in Australia. So I've been, I've been around in, in VR for a while now, and I've seen, I've seen some stuff. But the question is, um, why, why are you here? So I want to see some hands. So who here is working on a VR project or is planning on working on a VR project? Okay, basically almost everyone, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, who here is a programmer? Okay, who here is a game designer? And who's an artist? Okay, that's an even split. Um, and who here is responsible for VR motion sickness or locomotion in your project? Okay, technically I should have seen every single hand just come up because you're all responsible. Um, you all have an opinion, you all have legs, you all locomote in real life. So you all should have an opinion in your project of how it should be done and, and, and how it should work. This should not be sort of pushed down to one single person and saying, hey, you're going to design our VR locomotion mechanic. No, this should be a thing that you all sort of think that it's important to you. And, but why is it important to me? Um, I've been doing many VR applications and I've tried many, many games. And some of them were really, really bad, and it made me really, really sick. Um, but sort of the reason why I'm giving this talk today, it sort of dates back to mid-2015. Um, I was one of the first developers in Australia who had access to the first HTC Vive dev kit, or at least the second one, or the, the one that they sent out, which wasn't 3D printed. Um, so I estimated at the time where I got mine, I, I sort of knew of like 10, maybe, maybe 15 kits were in Australia. So the first day I got it, I played all the demos, and then the second day I made my own prototype, uh, which I then continued to develop into what is now GravLab. And so I made a prototype. After a month, I decided, well, I have, to, I have to show this to people. Not because I was proud of my game. I was proud of what you can do in a system where you can walk around the room, where you can grab things, where you can place things around the room, and suddenly you're an actor in a VR world instead of being an almost passive observer. So I wanted to share, I wanted to spread my VR enthusiasm. So what I did is I partnered with a local gaming bar, Reload Gaming Bar in uh, Canberra, where I'm based, and we did a VR night. So I went there with my HTC Vive, there were a couple of other developers that had uh, some DK2 demos and things. And we just set up, and it was a massive success. Like, everyone came in, and obviously, long queues at each station, and everyone was like trying VR and was happy about it. Um, so, I had a queue of like maybe 20 minutes, like five, six people. And um, there was this, one, was this one woman, she wanted to try it. So, she queued for 25 minutes, and then she decided, well, I'm just going to have a drink and go to the bar and try some other stuff first and then come back later. So I was doing my demos, and the evening progressed. And then I saw her sort of walking past me, and I had no cue. So I was like, hey, uh, there's no cue now. Do you want to give it a try now? And she was like, no, nah, like, VR isn't for me. And then she left. 
So what happened? Like what made her so uncomfortable that she didn't want to try the HTC Vive? And I, feel, I felt hurt. Not that she didn't want to try my game, um, not that she didn't want to try virtual reality this evening, maybe she has some other thing to do, but she said VR isn't for me. So something happened that she was just turned off by VR as a concept. And I've been at this stage doing VR for four years and I'm doing it every single day. And, and that's just, I felt, I felt sad. I felt a, a massive sadness in me where I was like, like, how can someone not be amazed by this? And if you've tried virtual reality and, and you've tried how, and you've seen how great it is, you, you might feel that sadness too if someone, if someone says to you, VR isn't for me and I don't like virtual reality, it's not a thing. So she felt uncomfortable in the VR experience. She felt discomfort. And there are many, many causes for discomfort. And um, I'm going to list some of the potential causes here. And by, by no means is this an extensive list of every cause for, for discomfort. But I'm just going to quickly mention them. So if you've got a headset that's low resolution, like the DK1, DK2s, they were low resolution, that can cause discomfort. If you have high latency in the headset, uh, again, DK1, DK2, maybe some custom solutions that, that people are using, the latency is too high, so the latency between your head movement in real life and the head movement of the virtual camera, again, discomfort. Um, if you have aliasing in your game, meaning you've got like flicker in the background on lines and things, um, they're different for each eye because they're rendered separately. So it means you've got flicker that's different for each eye. And if you ever looked like, if you ever looked um, at a street with like polarized sunglasses and you see the reflection not match up, it, it can cause discomfort. Um, if you have low or inconsistent frame rate, that's a big one. Um, you want to hit the native refresh rate of the device that you're using. So that's uh, was 75 on DK2, now it's 90 on the Rift um, consumer version and the Vive and sort of 60 to 120, depending on what mode you use on PlayStation VR. So you want to hit that as a, as a, as a minimum. You want to hit that as, a, as your target frame rate. And if you're lower than that, um, you're sort of falling into like a weird thing where you're trying to reproject the frame and it's, it's not good. And then sort of in a similar way, if you have low FPS animations, so if you're rendering your game at 90 hertz and 90 FPS, but you've got a, a 24 FPS animation, that can seem out of place, and your brain just says, okay, well, this looks wrong. Um, best case scenario, it doesn't look believable. Worst case scenario, it actually makes someone sick. Um, and then, yeah, time warp, uh, time warp and reprojection artifacts. So this happens when you don't reach your target frame rate, and the runtime decides to create an artificial frame to fill the gap. And no artificial frame is as good as, a, as the real deal. So you want to hit that 90 FPS. And then this is an interesting one. This one is called Virgin's Accommodation Conflict. Um, and this basically means there's a focal plane where your eye feels more com most comfortable. And sort of most headsets are targeting that focal plane. Uh, but if something is really far away from that focal plane or really close, um, it can also cause discomfort. I have slides in the end if you have time and we can go through these things uh, as well. And then, but the biggest one is the um, visual vestibular mismatch. So that's probably the most um, accurate description of what's happening, what we commonly say that's motion sickness. Because motion sickness is probably not the right word because we don't really get sick by the motion, we're getting sick by the lack of motion. So in a way, saying simulation sickness, sim sickness might be better. But again, this word has also been used by, by, some, by some other people for other things. Um, so I'm just going to keep calling it motion sickness, and I think we can all agree that what I mean when I say motion sickness in VR. Um, you don't have to be overly correct about that. And sort of the biggest thing I'm going to talk about uh, through the whole slides is how can you um, prevent motion sickness and what um, locomotion methods do exist. And that sort of brings me to the concept of VR legs. Um, so the idea that the more you try VR and the more you sort of get used to it, um, the, the more you can stomach, right? So you're, getting, you're training your VR legs and you become fitter in VR and then suddenly you can do like five hour sessions in virtual reality. And as with the title of this presentation, I have really strong opinions about that. Uh, VR legs, just they, forget about them. They, they don't exist. It, it's not, it shouldn't be something that you, is part of your game design. Um, many people will never get their VR legs. Many people had VR legs to begin with 
and now don't have them. Um, and I'm one of those cases. In the beginning with the DK1 in the Rift coaster, the roller coaster application, I could have done all day long, standing and backwards and spinning myself while doing it. I would have been fine. But now I'm getting motion sick playing a normal game on a screen because the, the field of view doesn't match. So some people actually get more motion sick the more, try, the, the more they try it. And then I'm not saying that you should make games that have no locomotion at all, I'm, or you shouldn't expect people, you should design for zero motion sickness. So what I'm saying is that if your game requires people to get used to it, that's not a good thing because they might not want to invest an hour or two a day to build up resistance to your game. And also, what kind of first impression is, is it of your game that it's going to make them sick and people have to force themselves through the first couple of hours? And every person that gets sick, and with sick I mean sick to their core, not just a bit of discomfort, but sick to their core, is one person less in virtual reality. That person might not come back to virtual reality as that woman did in my, in my beginning story. And you want to design for comfort. And this is a tweet by Jason Rubin, and he's head of content at Oculus. And he basically says, well, you can do whatever you want. Like, it's really up to you. But the broadest audience is the one that feels most comfortable in your application or in your game. And this is sort of the business perspective where you're saying, okay, that's your target market. You want to reach the broadest audience that you can get to sell the most games. And that's definitely one way to look at it. Um, the other one is like, even if you're designing something for a specific group, like, is really the first impression that's going to make them sick? Like, it's, ma it's making them sick the first impression of your game you want them to have. Um, so there, there are many ways of justifying to not use any sort of um, methods to reduce motion sickness. But you just have to keep in mind, like, who, you go, who, who do you want to reach? And what do they think about your game? Um, and the thing is that VR isn't perfect, and many of the things on the slides before, they probably will never be fixed, at least not in the short term. But our brain is not perfect either. Um, our brain just it wants to be tricked. At, uh, we have, we've been, like, we, were, we evolved into accepting things for real that are not. And all optical illusions um, are an example for that. So if you can design around motion sickness by tricking the brain, that's a viable solution. You don't have to make a game that has like zero locomotion just because you're afraid of motion sickness. There are a couple of things that the brain just accepts as okay that you can use, and the uh, next slides will elaborate on that a little bit. And so here are some of the VR locomotion methods, and, and I don't think this is one, at least I hope it's not one. Um, <laughs> But again, this is not an extensive list of everything that's out there, but these are the things that I have sort of come across over the years and that I think might be a viable thing. Uh, and the first one is easy. You just have no VR locomotion. So that meaning you're not moving the player at all. Um, the next one is sort of in, at the high end, it's like treadmills. Like that's sort of a brute force solution to VR motion sickness. Just build an omnidirectional treadmill. That means a treadmill that, only, that goes forward and side to side. And you can do that with like a dish, or you can build a treadmill made out of treadmills, like those omnidirectional ones. Um, and that's like a, the high-tech solution that might not be super viable. Um, and then you can use traditional gamepad locomotion, meaning that you um, adopt sort of the traditional locomotion schemes that use with a gamepad into virtual reality. And that is good for if you have a game that is more like a traditional one, uh, like a story-based game, or um, I have a couple of, just a couple of examples. Um, and then there are ways to make that more comfortable, as opposed to make everyone sick. Um, teleportation, that is probably one of the biggest locomotion ideas right now that are being used. Uh, many, many HTC Vive games use teleportation to move around the world. And there are many different ways of how to, how to implement that. Um, there's micro-teleportation, which is sort of a, um, something in between gamepad and teleportation. Um, and this one's a bit esoteric, but I just included it because it's, it's very novel. Um, you turn around at the tracking boundaries, so you've got a limited space. So basically, if you want to walk forward in the game world, you just kept, keep walking in your, in your play space until you hit the wall, and you turn around, and again, you keep walking forward. And there are ways to sort of simulate like a stable environment in the world. I've got videos for each of these slides, so it's going to be much easier to explain once you see the video. 
Um, Non-Euclidean geometry is, is really fun. So if you can trick, if you can make your play space much bigger in virtual world than it is in your real world, and just you sort of trick the brain into not realizing that it's been walking to the same space in the real world, but it's somewhere different in the game world, that's quite interesting. Um, redirected walking is, is a fun one. However, it's, it's super hard to do in, uh, in a sort of consumer environment. So the idea is that when the person is walking straight in the VR experience, you actually make them walk in circles in real life by slightly twisting their view with every step they make. And that works really well in a massive space. Um, like there are some, some figures out there, like most people are saying you need roughly a circle with a radius of 20 meters. So people won't notice that. Um, I've tried a game experience where it is in a circle with a diameter of two meters, so one meter radius, and I got really sick by doing that. Um, again, this is something that might work, especially if you have a big warehouse space, this might be a viable option. And then Vault Pool. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, this one sort of emerged once you had um, tracked hand controllers, where you literally grab the vault and you pull yourself forward. And this seems weird in a normal game settings, but there are a couple of examples where this one works really well. And then the last one I have on my list is head steering, uh, or second to last, uh, head steering. The idea that your head basically can act as a joystick. It, in general, I would not recommend using something like this, and I have a slide that explains why, and probably this is, as a spoiler, this was the one that made me motion sick the most, except the redirected walking in a one meter radius, but that wasn't viable to begin with. Um, and the last one is track position change, where you track the position of an object, like your hand or your head, and depending on its movement, you do something in the game world. Um, the video will explain it a bit further. Um, but with all of these things, there's a bit of expectation management you have to do. Uh, first to yourself, that none of these solutions will be perfect in your game. Or the, it's, it's very unlikely that they will be perfect. There is no silver bullet to just implement and say, hey, we have solved VR motion sickness. There's nothing, there's nothing yet there. Um, there's very little research that has been done recently in VR motion sickness, and it's, it's also really hard to do. And so, so far, no one has found like, that magic silver bullet, and it might not even exist. And then you also have to warn players. If you find that you have, you have figured out like, a very novel approach to do VR locomotion, like, you don't know. Like, only because you feel comfortable, it doesn't mean that the broad audience doesn't know. So you should definitely warn your players, if I give a menu, menu option that's like experimental mode, just warn them that this might make them motion sick, but it might be also the best thing for them ever. And while we're at um, warning players, all the videos I'm going to show have a first-person view. So that means you see my view, and you're just sitting here, just you had lunch, and you're sort of quite comfortable, and suddenly the screen will be shaking, and the stuff in your field of view will be shaking. Um, so you might get motion sick just by watching this talk. And it's just something that you have to bear with, uh, with it. And again, you warn the players, so I warned you. Um, and let's just dive into the, the deep end of the VR locomotion mechanics. So the very first one is you have no artificial locomotion whatsoever. And this means that you never ever touch the camera in the game. You never override the camera's position, you never override the camera's rotation. Um, it comes from the SDK, it comes from the engine. So when you move around the real world um, in like a room scale environment, or you sort of lean left to right in a seated environment, or you rotate your head, all this movement in the game world comes from the SDK. So you get the one-to-one -one movement of the virtual camera to your real world uh, head. And this is like almost by default the most comfortable one because you're not doing anything to the player. Um, but it can be limiting um, because like you just got this area that you work with and that's all. But um, so this is a video, um, this is Job Simulator by Alchemy Labs. And this game shows that you can do enticing experiences and have enticing stories in a small confined space. So what you see here is me walking around my little play area. Uh, so my play area is pretty much from here to here uh, in the, on the recording. And you just walk around this little convenience store counter thing and everything is around you and you still get to have a fun time in VR. And this is especially a very good beginner experience of virtual reality. And then 
Treadmills are on the other end. So as you can see in this video, they're using a DK1. So the ideas of treadmills has been around for a long time. And this obviously can work, but it's also obviously something that probably your, your players won't have at home. So it might not make sense to design for it if you only have then 100 or maybe 500 people that have the hardware at home. Uh, at the same time, um, so I tried um, these treadmills and I personally didn't find them comfortable, but I didn't spend um, enough time to actually learn, relearn how to walk in those treadmills because it's, it's not the same real movement as in real life. So you still have to learn it. Uh, to me, it felt, it felt a bit like being strapped into one of those baby walkers. Um, <laughs> but again, you, you learn how to walk in those, uh, but again, most people probably won't have it. And so going back to a more viable option, and this one is being used in many, many games. And it's sort of the traditional sort of gamepad locomotion. And obviously you can do it with a mouse and keyboard as well, and the same rules apply. Um, and there are a couple of ways um, you can implement that, and a couple of things that are really important when you do. You should avoid your rotation. So that right stick on the gamepad, that stick is dead to you now. You're never gonna touch that. This stick is gone. If, you have a, if your game uses that, you just get a big knife and just chop off that stick at all, so people can't use it in a public demo. Um, your rotation is probably the thing that makes you the most sick in virtual reality. Uh, we are usually fine um, if, the, if the head camera is just moved forward or backward, but the moment you start rotating it, that's bad. And in general, you, you never ever change the pitch of the camera. Um, in most cases, it's important to keep the horizon, even if it's an artificial horizon in your game, to keep it stable, to keep the brain something that it can hold on to. Um, acceleration is another thing. We don't feel speed. We only feel the change of speed. You only feel acceleration. So when you're in a car or in a, in a plane and you start accelerating, you feel it. You're being pushed back in your seat. You feel it with your body. You feel it with your vestibular system. But the moment you're at your cruising speed, it's fine. There's nothing going on in your vestibular system. So in a game environment, that means that if you push forward on a stick, you don't slowly accelerate the player. You don't use like the built-in physics system of your engine, but you just put them straight at the, at the target speed, just at the run speed or at the walk speed. Maybe you can do, like once you're halfway there, you reach from sort of walking speed to running speed, but you never do any acceleration. Um, and then that leads me to forward movement with constant speed. That is usually all right. So if you move the player just forward for constant speed, and forward I mean the look direction, um, that works. However, some people get sick. Like I get sick when I do this and for, for a longer period of time. So even something that seems very timid, there's a percentage of people that will not be able to play your game if you do that. And then detaching rotation, if possible, is another one. And I have a video for that because it's much easier to explain in a video. Um, so this game here is Robinson uh, the Journey by Crytek. And the video is by Nature of Gaming. Um, so what they do, they do a couple of things. Um, they rotate the player with the right stick, but they don't have a linear rotation with constant speed. They snap turn. So the idea is that you, the raw rotation, the yaw rotation, has been done um, instantly by like 15 or 45 degrees or sort of any value in between. And what they do, instead of just instantly turning the player, they give you a small lerp. So they very quickly turn you, and much quicker than you can actually turn your head. And what they also do, and it's hard to see in this video, uh, I believe they also do have a motion blur once you actually, once you actually do that. So the idea is that to give the um, brain um, very short period of sort of the wrong movement and still end up in the right spot, and your brain is usually fine with that. This is much better than sort of the constant slow turning that you have with normal uh, yaw stick turning uh, on a gamepad. And um, what they also do, which is quite interesting, if you look forward and you push the stick forward, you're gonna move in your look direction. But if you look forward, but you look up into the sky, you stop walking. Uh, and you get slower and slower, and the moment you start look up straight up in the sky, you stop walking. So the idea is that um, your brain wants to know where it's going. If you look at your feet and you walk forward, you even get motion sick in real life. So, or some people will do at least, I do. Um, so what they do is they prevent 
the forward direction is just not where the, like where the head is sort of pointed, but also if it's pointed at the ground. So if you point at the ground, you don't walk forward. And this works really well. Um, also, you don't strafe. Um, strafing is some, something that you shouldn't do in virtual reality. People might get sick. And you rarely strafe in real life as well. I, I bet if I asked you now, when was the last time that you strafed in real life, you couldn't, you couldn't tell me. <laughs> Um, so of course, going to the next one, you can, you can modify this traditional gamepad behavior once you actually have a controller that's positionally tracked. So this is a game called Onward by Downpour Interactive. And what they do is when you point your controller forward and you press forward, you move forward. But the moment you point your controller to the right and you press forward, you walk to the right. Uh, so the direction of the controller de uh, is determining the forward direction, not your field of view, not your gaze. And this can work well. Many people like this uh, locomotion scheme. But especially when I tried walking backward and turning the controller, I, start getting, I started getting sick. So um, as with everything, every locomotion mechanic, it might work for some, but it might not work for all. And there's no silver bullet. But this is definitely something that people like, and people have actually requested to be implemented in other games as well. And then, so this one is detaching rotation. So on the left, um, those are two videos of Dirt Rally by Codemasters. And on the left, that's sort of the normal implementation, right? You would just parent your camera to the car. And every movement of the car is mirrored. What you see on the right is the rotation for pitch and roll is, for, for roll is, oh, for pitch and roll is detached. Your rotation is still the same, because you still need to point in the direction that you're driving to. But see, the car is rolling, and the horizon stays stable. And for example, if you drive uh, um, having a hill climb race in Dirt Rally with this option on, the moment your car actually goes up the hill, you have to look physically in the real world up um, to look out of the windscreen. And this means that you are forcing the player to tilt their head. And then when they tilt their head, they actually get feedback on the vestibular system that matches to what they're seeing. So this is something that, you, that's, that's, that can easily be done in cockpit games and that can avoid motion sickness because we are forcing the player to actually mimic the motion of the car with their head. And now going to teleportation. And this is probably the biggest thing and this has been used by many, many games. Um, and there are, again, different ways of how to implement that. Um, especially before there was the HTC Vive and we had no track controllers, uh, at least most of us. Um, we can either do... Uh, it, you can do it gaze-based, so everywhere you're going to look at, um, you're going to teleport there. Or now we've got hand controllers, we do it pointer-based, we just point at where you want to go, and, and that's it. You can change your implementation uh, of how you do the trajectory. So you can either do it linear, like a laser pointer, or you can do it like parabolic, that many games use now because it just works really well, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, you can differ your uh, implementation on what the final location is going to be. Like, what do you allow as a final target? Everything or only certain nodes or like a mix out of those two? And then there are many, many additions to how you can do make a teleport much nicer. And I'm going to go through some of them. And many of those additions also apply to other locomotion mechanics. So the very first one, um, so that's a game called Mini Golf VR by uh, Virtual, uh, Virtual X by Nathan Beatty. Uh, he's Melbourne-based, so coming here from Australia. Um, and he, he was, his, he, his game had one of the first implementations of teleport, just to get around the environment. And his teleport trajectory is linear. So literally, you point at the floor, and it's a stray ray, a straight ray cast onto the floor. And wherever you hit that floor, you're going to teleport there. And this works really well. However, it has a couple of issues. Um, and we didn't know about those until we actually tried something like this and then we developed better mechanics. So the first issue, it becomes really hard to aim at objects that are or at locations that are really far. Because if it's something that's really far, the slightest change in your hand has a big effect on the final location. And we are not good at holding a steady hand with the arms sort of stretched out. Like we're really bad at that, and it becomes really jittery. So it's really hard to teleport at something that's really far away. Um, at the same time, it's possible to teleport across the whole map as long as the, the, the floor you want to teleport to is visible. So I could teleport across this whole environment just by pointing at the far edge. And this might be uh, what you want in your game, but maybe in your game, 
you actually story based and you want people to move past your environment in a normal speed and see all those things that you built and don't just zoom past them. Uh, and then the last one is if you hit that spam, that teleport button, and you just point at the floor and you just continuously press it, it just means that you can just teleport very, very quickly through the whole environment. It's almost like running through the whole environment and then suddenly it can make you sick again. And also the problem that maybe you don't want to run, make people run through your level. Uh, or if you're in multiplayer, you don't want people to just be able to traverse the whole multiplayer map and just, just uh, rape the, the, the spawn point of the other team. So this is um, the lab by Valve. And they were the first ones, almost the first ones to do implement teleportation really, really well. So there are a couple of things happening here. So first of all, the trajectory is parabolic. Uh, which suddenly means there's a maximum distance that you can tele teleport to. And it also means that through most of the range that you can teleport to, it is really accurate. Because even at a very far range, um, even uh, a slight movement in your hand doesn't change the, um, the final location that much. Um, what you can also see is that they prohibited steep angles in, in the teleport, which also means uh, it's much easier to aim. Um, what you're also doing is when you point at the floor, you're not only seeing your final location, you also see a visualization of your play space, of the area where you set up the walls or the boundaries. So not only do you see where you're going to end up, you're also going to see if the object that you want to reach is inside your play space and then you can later on walk there. Um, it also tells you that, um, maybe tells you that, hey, I'm at too far at the edge of my play space, I want to walk into the middle and you just remind people in a very intuitive way where they are in the real world and where they should probably be uh, to make it a better experience. And then the last thing they did is only if you point at the floor, only if you can teleport, they fade in this blue grid to tell people, hey, yeah, this is a surface that you can actually teleport to. There is nothing more frustrating than in a game hitting like an invisible wall or trying to open a door that's not supposed to be opened and not being able to get there where you actually want to get. So by just communicating, where, hey, this is an area you can walk to, it just tells the player instantly, hey, yeah, I can explore this space. And it depends on your game if you really want that, but it's, just, it's a good addition for if you have something where finding the exact position of something is maybe not super uh, important to solve a puzzle or something. Um, so going on to the next one, um, if your trajectory is physics-based, so this is budget cuts, and budget cuts is probably right now the gold standard of how you do teleportation well in virtual reality. Uh, so budget cuts uh, by Neat Corporation is a stealth game or stealth puzzle game, basically. Um, we're trying to infiltrate like a facility uh, and not to be detected. So they have this teleport mechanic where instead of having like a abstract visualization of, yeah, I'm gonna teleport, they actually make it their own. They actually make it part of their gameplay. So you have this teleport gun that shoots a teleport ball into the world, and it lands there, and wherever it lands, that is your final location. Um, not only is it great to make it part of your own game design and part of your own story and identity, it also means you can teleport around corners. So I deliberately pointed at that door frame and the ball bounced off into the room to a location that I wasn't able to see before. And because it's sort of a spying game, they can teleport to those locations sort of unseen, uh, or you unseen by the enemies. So this works really, really well. And again, budget cuts is probably the gold standard in teleportation right now. Um, so this is bullet train by Epic. And you can vary, so you sort of find a location. You can make it node-based, or you can have it freeform. The, the games that you saw before, they were probably more freeform-ish. Um, and this one here, Bullet Train, is based on nodes. Um, the advantage to that as well, like you can force people to go to a specific position. If you want to trigger a story queue, maybe you've got like a, like a screen coming on with vital information that they otherwise just would have walked past or would have teleported past, they would have never seen it. So it's great for points of interest. And then you can also vary that. Um, this is Destinations by Valve, where they mixed um, those two. So you can still teleport anywhere, but you sort of got this sticky node area that when you teleport to, you can actually um, uh, offer more additional interaction. So for example, if you teleport to this node, uh, only then it fades in this image. And so if this is sort of the, grow, uh, the, the big overview of teleportation. And again, you want to make teleportation your own. You want to make teleportation, oh wait, sorry, there's, there's a couple more things, sorry. Um, there's addition. Um, and again, so this is Trickster VR, and 
um, they added something that's a lurping. So instead of appearing at the spot there, uh, you're gonna lurp there very quickly. And because a lerp is not super comfortable, because you've got lots of change in your visual field, they actually add vignetting. So they, they sort of restrict your field of view into like the focal point where you actually want to go. Um, at the same time, they're making vignetting their own. Um, they don't just fade in black. They actually, the moment you uh, are at your teleport location, they spawn like almost like paper particles that are flying away. And this looks really cool and gives a really cool effect. And they make teleportation their own in their game. Um, cooldowns is another thing. Um, that sort of solves the problem of, hey, yeah, you can just spam a teleport button and zoom across the level and, and have maybe an unfair advantage in multiplayer. Um, cooldown could be, for example, you're in a multiplayer and you've got a teleport tool in your hand and it needs to recharge. So you can only teleport a certain distance or you can only teleport um, X times per minute. Um, or um, it's actually a device that overheats, so you actually have a cooldown. Uh, another one is fades and blinks. Uh, or fades slash blinks. The idea is that you fade out at the old location and then you fade in at the new location so you don't actually make the person instantly appear somewhere. And this is quite interesting. Um, so I found, I found this tweet and they actually recorded a play session in the lab and they recorded the, the, the fade movement and they found out that at frame zero, so when you're about to teleport, you're still at the old position. But then when you actually want to teleport, the lab Valve moves you to the new position and then starts fading out. And then f you don't move again, and then you fade back in at the same location. And this seems weird, right? Like, why would you do it? Like, you should just fade out, move, and then fade in. Well, it turns out this is, seems to be more comfortable, and it's probably because you give the brain a little head start. So this happens so quickly that you don't actually notice this in game. but. Your brain needs a bit of time to process the new information if it sees something new. And if you give that brain like a tiny flash of the new location, and then you give it like fade out, fade in, so you give it actually time to process that new location, the moment you actually fade back in, it appears more comfortable. And this seems a bit esoteric, and just by telling you that this might work better, if you try this now, you actually think it might work better, like a placebo effect almost. Um, but apparently there were studies that sort of in non-VR related that shows that if you um, give someone sort of a glimpse of what they're going to see next, it's easier for the brain to process. So this might be a viable option. Um, but again, you, just, you should experiment that. You should implement it yourself and run it through a couple of people or hundreds of people and see what they like better. Um, and then this addition is, is funny. So this is a third person walking animation. So you still put a teleport trajectory into the world, and that could be anything. But instead of just teleporting there, your own avatar, so this is my avatar in VRChat by VRChat, actually starts walking there. And it's, it feels weird. Like for some reason, I start waving to my own character, thinking I would wave back. Because I felt sort of the disconnect. That that's not really me. That's just someone I control. And he should wave back if I wave at him, because I'm already controlling him. So he should just follow my every, every will. Um, and then why, the question is, why would you do it? And I, and I heard people chuckle, and I chuckled when I first saw that and heard about this. But then I actually talked to the VRChat guys, the friend of, the friend of mine, uh, friends of mine, and they explained it to me. VRChat is a social VR application where you meet with other people and roam around and go through worlds that they created in their avatars they created. Teleportation breaks social environments. Imagine you're talking to someone, imagine you're talking to me or you're listening to me talk and suddenly I appear on the other end of the room. You would be confused. And people are confused in a social VR environment when that happens. So teleportation, it might be most comfortable for you, but just because it's comfortable for you doesn't mean you make other people uncomfortable. So suddenly, not only do you have to follow sort of the norms and guidelines for a single person, you have to follow social conventions. So when you do this, what the other person sees is they don't see your trajectory, they just see your avatar walking in that direction, running in that direction. Your voice over the microphone is coming from that new location. So that means everyone else, they just see people running around. They don't see people just disappearing and appearing in a new position. And suddenly, this funny locomotion mechanic, it, it, it seems plausible. It seems like something that is suddenly viable in, in a social environment. 
And this also has a couple of other things. Um, there's a maximum speed that you can run with. There's a maximum distance you can do with a teleport. And it, it sort of becomes better for your game design as well, if, you're, if you require something like this. Um, and then another addition is the adjustable forward look, uh, um, direction. So that's the gallery by Cloudhead Games. Uh, if you point at the ground, you just teleport in your direction. But the moment you actually start using the touchpad on the controller or like a, the thumbstick or something, you can actually rotate your play space and rotate your forward direction. This means that you have more granular control over where you end up and where you're going to face. And by giving the player the control over this, A, it makes it easier to traverse your game, um, but also means that they know what's going to happen the moment they press the teleport button. They know where they're going to end up, they know they expect, they know that what they can see afterwards. And then the last thing, um, if you make teleport your own, that's the best thing. Make it IP appropriate. Um, again, budget cuts. Uh, there's some other games that use it as well. There's a game called uh, Spells and Stuff, where you show like little portions onto the ground and where they land up, that's where you teleport to. So the moment you can make your locomotion mechanic, and that doesn't necessarily need to be teleport, the moment you can make your locomotion mechanic your own and you can make it part of your story, part of your identity, that's the gold standard for locomotion and virtual reality. Um, going quickly to micro-teleportation, and I think I have to uh, dim the lights for this, oh, well, the lights in front as well. Is, that, is it hard to see? It's probably hard to see. Um, anyway, so what you can see here, uh, or maybe, um, is that the moment you actually um, try to make a normal game of teleportation, teleportation might not be the most comfortable thing in a normal game. Um, even gamepad locomotion might not be the most comfortable thing. So I implemented this for Technolust, uh, which is developed by um, Iris VR Inc. And it's sort of, a, sort of in between gamepad locomotion and teleportation. The idea is that when you press, press the stick forward, you teleport one meter every half second, which results in a walking speed of two meters per second, which is like a, a, brisk, a brisk walk. And the idea is that this looks horrible on a screen, by the way. Like, I hate YouTubers playing this game with this locomotion method on because it looks horrible in a YouTube video. And everyone is complaining, hey, this game runs at one FPS, what, what, what's going on? <laughs> um, but in VR, what I have realized is that my brain, at least, it doesn't care how it got somewhere. It sees that interesting shiny object over there and it just wants to get there. I focus on that object. I don't focus on how I got there, but my brain cares about getting there without getting motion sick. So this locomotion method moves you around the world. You still have the, sort of the granularity without like, choosing your location every single time you teleport. Um, and it's still, it has zero vection. There is no artificial locomotion in this. You just appear in new spaces. Um, and for my brain, this is comfortable. Um, but I also have found myself when I played this game that I swap between the normal, traditional gamepad locomotion, constant forward movement with, um, with uh, constant speed, and this locomotion mechanic. So we implemented like a button on the gamepad. You press that, that's a quick toggle between the two. And if I wanted, if I'm in a tight space where I want more granularity, I would switch back to a normal traditional gamepad. And if I have a large space, like a desert I have to walk through, I would switch back um, to this one that we titled Cloud Step. And I think I can turn the lights back on. Um, and so this one is a bit esoteric. Um, this is turning around at checking boundaries. This one is called uh, Walkabout, and it's been used in Cosmic Wandering by Tekton Games. So the idea is that you walk to the edge of your play space, then you press a button, and I think it's a grip trigger in this experience, uh, and then you turn around in the real world. But what's going to happen is the visual um, image is going to freeze and it's going to be blurry. And as long as you turn, that doesn't change. Your forward direction in the virtual environment doesn't change. And then you let, let go of the button, and everything fades back in and everything is crisp again. But suddenly you, you got again those two or three meters of your play space that you can walk forward. And this works quite well. Um, however, I got motion sick just by, by turning and have that, that blurry vision. Um, it might work for some people and um, I have not seen a proper game um, to implement this, at least to my knowledge. And um, it can also be um, 
boring to do in an environment where you have to like, traverse the desert, like walk 50 k's to walk the other end of the desert. This, this would take ages. And um, the other option is, the other thing is that with the HTC Vive and the fact that you have a cord coming out of your headset, you have to alternate the direction that you're turning. If you're always turning to your right, you eventually wrap yourself up. So I've seen implementations of this where the moment you actually do this and it sort of tells you to turn around, it actually tells you in which direction to turn. So it keeps tracks of your turns so you don't actually tangle yourself up in the court. Um, this just shows that this is an interesting idea that might not be perfect and it might require a couple of stopgap solutions, but it doesn't mean that this should not be this, this should be discarded as something that doesn't work. Um, and all of these methods are not perfect, but maybe you can build upon those methods and make them better or come up with something that's sort of similar but works much better. Um, and then we got um, non-Euclidean geometry. So this game is Unseen Diplomacy by tri Triangular Pixels. <laughs> and it's like, a, it's like a stealth game and like a, you have to break into a facility as well. And the idea is that if you confuse the player with your level geometry, and the, the moment something is outside of your field of view, you, ex you replace it by something else, you can actually create an infinite amount of space in your VR experience and by having them come back to the same space. Yeah, like just by knowing that, you will realize in the game that, hey, I'm, I'm now somewhere where I shouldn't be. Like you realize that you're in the same spot in the real world because you can feel a dent in your carpet or you can feel like the breeze of your window, but it doesn't matter. Like you already got there and then your brain discards that. Um, so this works really well. However, again, it's not a silver bullet for all games because most games you wouldn't play in like uh, closet-sized rooms. And also it requires a big play space. But if it works in your game, and again, this game makes it part of their game, like the, the limitation of this play space suddenly becomes one of the main game designs and game mechanics, it works really well. And then this is Whirlpool, and I really like Whirlpool. And this has been weird for a long time because like, why would you do it? But it, I want to show some examples that um, make it seem like why haven't done this before. Um, so there are a couple of different things. I'm just going to go through them. So this is Climby um, by Shadowbrain Games. And this is sort of the most freeform world pull that you can do. You can actually grab the air and pull yourself forward. You can actually grab the air and pull yourself up and you're going to jump. And this seems weird, um, but imagine grabbing something, right? You grab something and the moment you grab, you actually move your head. So you actually give your vestibular system um, some, some stimuli. Like suddenly your brain feels something and it might not be the perfect exact same movement as in the real world or in the, in the virtual world. But in that moment, that input is so strong that your brain just says, okay, yeah, all right, I'm good. And our brains aren't perfect and VR isn't. And you can design around those limitations. Um, climbing does some other interesting things. Um, so you have the vignetting going on when you move very quickly. So it just fades in. And it also displays um, those blue rectangles on the ground. That is actually your floor height or floor um, plane that you have set up in your VR experience in, or in Steam. Um, so it actually grounds you into the place and it just fades out again. The next one uh, has restrictions. Um, so this one is less free form. This is the client by Crytek, and um, it's currently available for um, gamepads, but there's an Oculus Touch version coming. And this is less free form, it's with restrictions. So you actually animate the player almost around the corner, even though he is not turning in real life. But because your hands are busy and because you're not really thinking about locomotion, you're thinking about, hey, which grip is the best? Or like, do I have to chalk my hands again? And like, what's the time? And like, how do I get there and stuff? Um, your brain is occupied with that, and just by giving it like some input with the hands, your brain is oops, your brain is fine. However, because you're giving it restrictions, it's not the same movement in real life, and this can cause some some problems. So this is again the client by Crytek, and you might, some might have seen this video. This is a public demo at the Microsoft Store, and so he's climbing and he's getting some wrong input because it's it's animated, right? It's it's not a real deal. And it works in most cases, but in this case, it just didn't. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a bad person, because the first thing that, I was, that popped into my mind when this happened is like, oh, is the, is the rift okay? Did the rift break? <laughs> um, and I was touch controllers okay, because they're rare. 
Um, but apparently, the person was fine as well. The Facebook post said the person was fine, and Aon, Aon was fine. Um, but it just shows that if you give a person some wrong input, it might actually not work. And especially if you have a standing experience, that might actually be a problem. Uh, okay, I think two times is enough. <laughs> um, this one is called World, uh, this one is, um, again, uh, Whirlpool, but with restrictions. And this game is called uh, Lone Echo, not Lone Ekai, uh, by Ready at Dawn. It's, um, uh, it's an Oculus Touch title. Uh, I don't think it's a launch title. And this was shown in Oculus Connect. And it's probably my favorite VR experience right now. Um, it's in zero G and you're a robot. And the way you move around the environment is by grabbing things that are around you and you pull yourself along those items. And suddenly, world pull makes sense because you're in zero G, you're a robot at the outside of a space station. Obviously, that's the way you, look, you move around. And um, interesting one is also that it's zero G. So if you grab it and you pull yourself forward, you keep floating in the direction until you hit something or you sort of float into deep space and die or something. Or you spend the rest of your eternity in deep space because you're a robot and you don't die. Um, so this, this works really well and it felt very natural. And you also have a multiplayer version with like very fast paced movement and sort of like a, it's almost um, like endless game uh, in, as a VR game and it's great. And I didn't get motion sick and I get motion sick with literally everything. And I didn't, with their, I didn't get motion sick at all with their game, which means that whatever they're doing, it really, really works. And then you can do also world pull with tools. Um, so this is uh, Windlands by Psytech Games. And instead of grabbing it directly, you actually have like this, this uh, grappling hook mechanic. And I actually never got sick, but just by swinging around like Spider-Man. And that worked really well. Uh, Why well, I got sick in this game when you actually have to uh, move around with the gamepad or the touchpad on the HTC Vive controller and do some platforming. Um, so again, <coughs> sorry. Uh, World Pole works really well, and they're very, as you can see, there are very different ways of implementing it, and it actually makes sense for, for their games. And um, also, Windlands makes a part of their identity. So the next one is head steering. Uh, from my favorite locomotion mechanic to probably the least favorite one, at least in the first video. Uh, their first idea is to do keyhole steering. Um, the idea is that in the middle of the field of view, you can actually aim with your weapon. But if you put your head forward to the right or left, it actually acts as a joystick. So you move your head to the right, and then the, your Mac keeps spinning to the right. And this works for some people, but I actually got really sick just by doing that. And this one is Eagle Flight. Uh, I actually didn't get sick by doing this. Uh, you, you tilt and roll your head, and that sort of makes your bird bank, and then you just fly in that direction. And that works quite well. There are also a couple of other things that you can notice. There's vignetting going on, and that vignetting is dynamic. Um, it's not just a constant vignette that just fades in whenever you do something. It's dependent on the direction and the speed, and also to the distance of objects. So if you fly past a building that's only on your right side, only the vignette on the right would fade in. Same with like left and bottom and top. And they also have a beak, which I'm going to mention in a, in a moment again. Um, and then, so this is sort of one of the last um, mechanics. It's tracking position change. And I'm just going to show a video for that. This is arm swinger. And the idea is that you move your arms like a laterally stroll. And because you're doing this and your head is moving, you, can, you walk actually forward. But it doesn't really work well in a laterally stroll. It actually works much better if you do toggle paddling. And so this is a multiplayer game. So if, uh, imagine if you had like a, a multiplayer tournament on stage and everyone would just be doing this. Uh, I think that would be great. Um, uh, and this one is called Rip Motion and it's by a guy called Smirking Cat. And so the idea is that it's head bopping. So the moment you do this, you just move the player forward. And it looks silly, but it works. And that's, that's amazing. Um, and just because something looks silly, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, but it's definitely fun, and especially if you have like a multiplayer social game that's asynchronous on PlayStation VR or something, that would be a hit at parties. Um, and then this one is selfie tennis, and this one is even better. So they... <laughs> <laughs> uh, selfie tennis by VR unicorns. <laughs> and so the idea is that you only do it when you spawn certain items. And they spawn this little stick horse, and it's absurd. But in a universe where you're playing tennis with yourself, and you can kill giant tennis balls with a laser sword. 
your locomotion mechanic on, of riding on a stick horse is probably not too bad. <laughs> and what these last ones are trying, what I'm trying to show with that is that if you can come up with something that's creative, even though the initial impression of it is like, how stupid is that? It works really well. Like, if you, if you make it part of your game, if you make it part of your identity, and that's probably the biggest takeaway, if you make it part of your identity, and make the locomotion mechanic not just a stopgap solution, but make it part of the gameplay, this is the gold standard. And there are a couple of additions to further reduce motion sickness, and I've, many of them are already mentioned in the talk. Um, but this one I haven't. In devices where you have no positional tracking, that means gear VR, cardboard, or even something like a 360 video, you want to remove objects that are too close to you. Um, you, you. You can't track position of the head, so you don't want people to sort of lean forward and inspect things up close. So if you have close objects, just remove them. Um, give people a stable point of reference. Give them a heart or a cockpit or like a nose or a beak. Um, and then vignetting, and we've seen that. So for the first one, um, this is an experience I'm doing with Australian Sports VR that I'm doing for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And so this is the HTC Vive version, and you've got the campfire and the picnic table and all the things on the picnic table. Um, and interestingly, in the, in the Vive version, this is fine, but in the Gear VR and Carport version, we had to move those way further back. So they're almost like not part of the scene, but they're still there, you can still see them, but people are not inclined to just inspect them up close. And this is Eve Valkari by CCP. Um, and they have an uh, impressive game and an impressive cockpit. However, the cockpit itself provides very little stable points of references. Um, everything around you is moving and those cockpits are basically like fighter jets. So you've got this massive canopy and you see everything happening around you and it can make people, it make, can make people feel uncomfortable. So in the game that I'm developing, Darkfield VR, what we decided that our um, spaceships, they're more like submarines instead of fighter jets. So we give you way more things that sort of box you in. And it might make you, it, you would think it makes people feel claustrophobic, but it, no, it actually in space, you want, you want that stuff that's around you. You want that massive um, um, beam here that gives you sort of the solid feeling of, hey, yeah, this is gonna protect me. I can bump into something and still be fine. And this is um, virtual nose by Purdue University. So they uh, published an article, I think, that where they basically claimed, hey, we solved motion sickness by giving people a virtual nose. And I know there's at least one, one developer here that has a virtual nose in their game, and it works. Uh, however, it's nothing, nothing other than um, a, a hut or a cockpit. And um, yeah, it, it works. And then we, see the, we saw the vignetting in Eagle Flight. Here's a better video. Um, that's a video by Upload VR, where you can see the vignetting in, in effect on the screen. And this looks weird on a screen. Like, this looks like almost like an error on the screen, like your rendering doesn't keep up. But in virtual reality, you don't actually notice this vignetting. What you notice is that you don't get motion sick, and you figure, and you think, like, how, how the hell did they do this? The vignetting is the answer. Um, however, the gaming industry is sometimes not the friendliest one. Um, so you always get someone complaining. And for sure, the people were complaining on Twitter about that annoying viewport restriction. And they asked if it's optional. And as a developer, sometimes you have, a, you have to have a, um, a firm stance on the topic. It's like, no, it's not optional. And this just means that people will complain. In Technolas, people complained that we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a, um, people complained about the, the cloud step locomotion mechanic. They complained that in the very first version we shipped, they, we didn't have a yaw rotation option. And then we added a yaw rotation option and people complained that they got motion sick by adding, by adding this. <laughs> so like, no matter what you do, someone will complain. And there's just this one point where you just say, I don't want to make people sick. And then when you, happen, when you reach that point, it's just, okay, I'm just gonna push through this and you get negative reviews on Steam for being a game that makes people motion sick. Uh, Windlands has negative reviews on Steam for making them motion sick. And then what, you, what do you expect? It's a game about swinging around like Spider-Man. Of course you get motion sick. Someone will always complain about that stuff. And the thing is that we have caused the motion sickness stigma. It's our fault. What was the first thing we did when we got our first DK1? 
we installed Rift Coaster, and we put everyone we knew, we forced the headset on their head and, ride, and let them ride Rift Coaster. And hopefully many of us weren't as, as bad as what happened here in this video. But just by the fact that we put people in Rift Coaster and gave them a low resolution, high latency headset and put them in the worst possible application for such a device, we caused the motion sickness stigma. We created that association that, hey, VR makes you motion sick. But I think the good thing is that now we know that we can fix it. This talk, um, if there's anything you want to take away from this talk, is that not all the locomotion mechanics here. Like that list is not extensive, and I'm sure just between the time I made this talk and given this talk, five or six new locomotion mechanics popped up. Well, what I want you to take away from this talk is that there are ways to solve locomotion. There are ways to reduce motion sickness. There are ways to trick the brain. And we all have to work together. And we all have to build upon the things other people have tried to make sure that the motion sickness stigma is not a thing in the future. Okay. Thank you. So we've got maybe time for one or two questions, but I'm also going to be outside if you've got any, anything more. Yep. Do you, I know it's early in its, in its life at this point, but do you ever see a time when it will be a ubiquitous device? Everybody will have an Oculus Rift in their house, or you know, something that's yep. something you can just slip on and, and easily have a go of rather than it being set up. And yeah. So the, the question was the ubiquity of virtual reality. And I totally see that that virtual reality is something that we're all going to have in, in one form or another. Maybe not now, maybe not, in, maybe not in five years. But eventually, I think virtual reality or even augmented reality are just forms of giving people more information and telling a better story. So if, if it's going to be something like cardboard or like a HoloLens or Magic Leap or anything like that, I do think that people will have something like that, the same way that most people of us have now a smartphone and most people have a TV. Down there, yeah. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is like 400 megabytes, so probably not. But I've heard that the talks were recorded, so um, that is probably a viable option. Cool. Thanks everybody for coming. And if you have any more questions, I'll be outside. <laughs>